Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Omar. I'm an engineer here at Google. And um, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Ellie and Holden. Uh, so if, if you uh, you know, face the, the challenge sort of you know, every year of thinking about your, who you're going to give to, which charities, which causes, um, which I'm sure we've all sort of tackled that challenge, uh, it can be really frustrating. Like, how do I evaluate? Uh, um, you know, what's the most optimal way to give? And uh, if you're a Googler and you're particularly analytic in your way of thinking about this, then when you actually go to the websites of these charities or you go to evaluators, you're often sort of dumbfounded by the lack of information and sort of the lack of transparency, at least, at least I have been. Uh, and so uh, one of my friends introduced me to Ellie and Holden, and what they're doing is trying to sort of bring a lot more clarity to, uh, to that problem. And I think that's going to be particularly relevant to anyone here at uh, Google who uh, is you know really interested in being very analytical uh, about uh, their evaluations? Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Ellen Holden from GiveWell. Should I sit while you're talking? I don't know. Up to you. I will. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Hey, I'm I'm Holden Karnowski. Uh, Ellie's gonna do the first part of the talk, and I'm not gonna distract him. I'll sit right down. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you all for coming and wanting to listen about GiveWell. I'm excited to tell you what. What we're doing, I mean, I think Omar gave a good brief intro. We're a nonprofit charity evaluator, and our mission is to help individual donors find organizations to support that you can confidently say are having a significant impact on the problems they're trying to solve. Now, GiveWell started with a, a simple question, which is essentially, where should I donate? And that's a simple question to ask, but we found it to be a very difficult question to answer. Um, and the way that the, we found the, the type of question that we were asking, for example, um, is a question that is, say, K through 12 education. You know, that's a cause that's in the news a lot. It's a known intractable problem to improve educational outcomes for children from inner city, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, you know, the, the types of questions that I have when I think about that problem are, well, what, you know, what works and what works best? Is it tutoring programs, smaller class sizes, better teachers. You know, those are the types of questions that I wanted to know the answers to when I thought about where to give. And because those problems are so difficult, when we first started talking about this, it was Holden and I and a few other friends at the investment firm we used to work at, we decided to form a small group of people to, to try to answer and work together to answer these questions. Now, we weren't giving a lot of money away. We each were giving maybe five to $10,000. But we wanted to make sure that when we gave our charity, we could have confidence that it was having a significant impact, that we were really finding the best organizations. And so to do that, we set about researching, researching these causes. And we tried a few different ways of getting information. To start, we went looking for an aggregate source of information that would tell us pretty much what, every charity, what charities do and whether it works. And the first site we came to that you might be familiar with is Charity Navigator. It's a pretty well-known site, and its approach is to rate charities on a four-star scale based on the financial information they provide on their tax forms. And specifically, they look at the percentage of the money they spend that goes to their overhead, say salaries and fundraising, relative to the amount they spend on programs, the direct services they provide. Now, that's important information to, say, weed out the very worst charities, the organizations that are maybe scamming you and using the money for themselves, but it obviously is not the type of information that's going to help you choose the best, that's going to help answer the types of questions that I talked about earlier. You know, with an education program, does tutoring work? Do smaller class sizes work? Do better teachers work? It has no bearing on that, on that question. And so when we found that, we, were, you know, we, we turned on to, the, to another, another arena because we didn't find the information there that, that could help us. The next place we turned, um, was charities directly. We said, you know, we can't get an aggregate source, let's go right to the, to the individual organizations and ask them what they're doing. And so I personally was researching clean water in Africa. That, that was the cause that I wanted to donate to. And when I asked charities for information, essentially saying, what are you trying to accomplish? And what's your evidence that those activities are best? They answered by and large with, you know, what I'd call a marketing slogan. The answers I got were, you know, $20 saves a child water for life. Uh, and I said, well, you know, that's great. You know, I'd love to give $20 to provide a child with water for life. How does that work? You know, what, what does my money get? And how does that calculation come out that I could have confidence 
that that number was a reasonable representation of what was actually going to occur. And when I dug deeper, they, they, weren't, they were either unwilling or unable to, to go any further with me. Um, it, it seemed pretty clear that they were surprised that I was asking the questions. Um, you know, some were, some were sort of happy and grateful, saying those are great questions, you know, we should be able to answer. Other organizations were suspicious. I mean, I think Holden, Holden was accused of, of working for a competitor and trying to get the inside edge on what this other charity was, was doing. Um, but so after, after those, two, those two attempts, we took the final try at, at getting information. We went right to foundations. You know, so foundations like the, Gate, the Gates Foundation, Google.org, other foundations are, you know, their essential mission is to identify great organizations, research them, and then support the ones that are best. And so we said, hey, foundations have this information. Let's go right to them and ask them about their activities and seek their advice about where we should give. And when we called them up, they, they would tell us, I mean, the conversation was essentially go as follows. We'd say, hey, you know, this is what we're looking to do. I'm interested in education. Where should I give? And they'd say, well, you know, go to our website. We have a list of our grantees. You can check those out. And, you know, we'd go to the website and, and look it over and see a list of names, you know, 500 organizations, each with five words about them. And we'd go back and say, hey, you know, this, what I'm looking for is information on the best. You know, I have a little money to give. I really want information that's going to tell me this is the best organization to support or can help me differentiate. And when we asked them for that, they said, look, you know, we're not really at liberty to discuss what one charity is doing versus another, why one might be better than another. You know, that's confidential, and we can't, we can't take a stand publicly that talks about what one grantee does versus another. And you know, that, was, that was disappointing and surprising. But nonetheless, we came to the end of this phase. We spent about you know, three to six months working in, these, in this small group at our investment firm doing this research. And while we were frustrated with the lack of information we could find, we wanted to make sure that we published what we had found so other people that wouldn't have to go through the same process that we did if they were interested in supporting those causes. And so we put up an old style wiki that we, we distributed internally in the, in the company that we worked at, and people could look at that to make their, their giving decisions. Um, and as we did that, Holden and I, in particular of our group, found ourselves really excited and passionate about the research we were doing. You know, I, I liked my old job at the investment firm, but when it came time to check out Friday, I didn't want to think about trading strategies or markets over the weekend. And when I started researching charity, I had the exact opposite response. You know, it was, the infra it was the research that was keeping me up at night. It's the stuff I wanted to work on over the weekend. And that led both of us to start thinking about taking this at full time, making it a project that we spent all our time on because we were so excited about the, the work we were doing. But before we were ready to go full time, the major question we had was, you know, how big a deal is the lack of information that we have? You know, we all, it seemed totally plausible to us that foundations like the Gates Foundation have access to great research. They give so much money. Relative, you know, they may give so much more money than I do that my $5,000, Holden's money, doesn't add up to a lot in the scheme of things. And so while I might not have access to information, it may not matter much that I don't because the money I give may not be that much. But as we started to look into the question, we found that the opposite was true, that, in fact, individuals make up the lion's share of giving in the U.S. And so for, as a way of framing it, you know, Bill Gates gives about $2 billion a year his, through his foundation, the Gates Foundation, including the, the Warren Buffett gift. And you know, that's about four times as big as the next biggest foundation in terms of dollars given away every year. And individuals collectively make up, up that part of the pie is more than 100 times as much as the Gates Foundation gives, and it's about six times as much as all foundations combined. And so when we saw those, when we had those two facts held together, the, you know, the lack of information and the fact that all this capital was out there with no mechanism for identifying the best organizations to go to, we thought this was a problem that was worth going after. And you know, we think that the, the reason that we're in this situation, the reason that you know, individuals have so much money to give, but there's no mechanism for allocating it well, is that charities are not now raising money based on demonstrating their effectiveness. You know, instead, and this is in my experience from you know, working part time when I was doing this on the side and in the last year doing this full time, they're primarily raising money through um, you know, inducing guilt in donors to say, oh, I feel so bad, I should give, 
or through uh, social, social events. You know, and that's the, that's the same thing we've heard from fundraisers, that you know, that's the way that charities are competing with each other to raise their money. And instead, you know, we'd like to, our mission at GiveWell is to change the incentives for charities, to, to put out to donors what the information on the effectiveness of the activities so that we can change the incentives and force charities to compete on their results as opposed to on their ability to market. And so in order to do that, we, we raised about $300,000 from our former coworkers and our former boss, and we used that money to offer grants to charities in five different causes. We offered grants of about $25,000 to $40,000, and we, about 150 charities applied for our grants. And in the application process, we told them that all the materials that they submitted would be made public, because we wanted to make a public website that allowed people to use that information to decide where to give. Um, in that process, you know, over the, about halfway through our research, we got some publicity, you know, both good publicity because the information we had put together was, was unique and great, and bad publicity because of mistakes we made. But nevertheless, we think that the resource that we've created now is something that doesn't exist anywhere else, and we think help, can help donors make more informed giving decisions. So I want to pause here to, to take questions, if you have any, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Holden to talk about some of the specific things we found in our first year. Oh. Well, uh, first of all, what were your categories? Uh, we looked at uh, two causes in the developing world, health and poverty, and three in the US, child care, education, and job training. It seems to me that one of the hardest things there is, you know, weighing short-term benefit versus long-term benefit. Did you actually, you know, think about different ways of doing that or? You know, I think we'll get, let's get to that question when we go through the specifics of the, the research we did. And right, then that's we can coming talk about up right that next. Okay, Other questions? All right. So I'm Holden Karnofsky. I said hi really quickly before. Um, and I want to talk about the research we did over the first year. Um, in the five causes Ellie mentioned and what we found. And, uh, you know, just for me personally, I mean, after a year, again, this started with us being donors, trying to figure out where to give. And I know that I've changed my mind an incredible amount um, on where the causes are that I want to give. So I'm going I'm to talk about these, and then I'm going to talk about what we're researching now, what comes next, and some of the causes that we may be doing down the line. Um, because one of the issues about GiveWell is that you know, we don't believe in using a formulaic approach to evaluating charities. We don't believe in one size fits all. Um, and so we really can't cover everything at once. And, and that's something I'm going to discuss is how we prioritize and what's coming up next. But first, I just want to talk about what came out of our first year. So first off, just talk about the US. And uh, one of the main things we were focused on is this idea of equality of opportunity and the achievement gap, um, which was originally my cause. Um, in the sense that, as an individual donor, I was giving five grand a year to inner city education charities, uh, you know, for, for three years or so before we started GiveWell. And um, to me, this had always been the most appealing cause because I sort of had always operated under the assumption that education is the key to opportunity, that if you can provide a kid with a better education, and it's something we, we must know how to do because we get the, the wealthier kids the good education, um, that you can make an enormous difference. And so these charts are a quick illustration of that. I mean, it's certainly, it's definitely a fact that people who grow up in socioeconomically better off households, they have higher test scores, they do better in school, they're more likely to graduate, um, they have higher earnings in adulthood, they have lower incarceration rates, um, and a whole host of other factors. And um, one of the... I, I have to say that one of the most sort of intuitive and appealing interventions we looked at kind of early on for dealing with this problem is the idea of scholarships. Um, we dealt with one charity that was basically offering scholarships to low-income children uh, for them to go from their public schools, which are often very poor quality public schools, to private schools. Not the most expensive private schools, but their choice of private schools, often parochial. And in my mind, this just seemed like a you know, a bankable intervention. It seemed like it made perfect sense. If you take a kid from these poor quality schools into an average one, they should do much better, and the achievement gap should, should close or should, you know, at least partway close. Um, and this is something very interesting, that in fact, in a lot of education, it's very hard to find really good 
rigorous studies of impact. Um, but this was one of the exceptions. This is, um, this is something that was studied using a randomized controlled trial, where what they did is they offered vouchers. They, offered, they had a lot of kids in New York City apply for these scholarships to private schools. And then they used a randomized lottery to choose some of the kids to get the scholarships. And then they followed both groups of kids, the ones who'd been offered the scholarship, whether or not they took it, and the ones who had not been offered the scholarship. And they tracked their test scores, and they tried to figure out sort of, you know, presuming that any difference they saw would be attributable to the scholarships. And the results are very surprising to me. So the details are written up on our website. But the short story is in these charts that the two groups started off in about the same place, underperforming on math and reading. Not surprising. They're low-income kids, and they were separated randomly. Um, but after three years, there was, there was no difference. There was no change. Um, this is one of the first things we found in the education cause. And I have to say that it, was, it came as a shock to me. Um, that something that seems to make so much sense didn't seem to have worked. And, and to me, you know, it's complex and there's debates and we've written it up, but to me this is evidence of something that's not working, at least to the extent I would think. Um, so we looked into this cause more and, and just to, you know, to get to the highlights, I mean, this to me starts to explain the conundrum and also the incredible challenge of education is that these high income and low income kids have a very large gap in proficiency the day they enter kindergarten at age five. And, and that's what this chart shows. It's about, that gap is about as big as it's going to get um, the day they enter kindergarten. And realizing this, I mean, it's something that is, is certainly known in the field, but wasn't known to us as donors, and is certainly something that we never heard a charity bring up, um, really made us look at a lot of these education interventions in a whole new light. Now, this is not to say that education interventions can't work. And in fact, we think we found at least one that we, we think does. We would at least bet on it or donate to it. Um, but it certainly makes you more skeptical that without proof to accept the idea of a fairly simple intervention closing this gap. Um, and so basically, we went through the charities that applied. We went through as much research as we could. And we found that there is very little, as I said, strong evaluation that could really isolate the results of programs in a way that study that I described before did. Um, there are a lot of studies where they simply compare kids in a program to kids not in a program and find that the kids in the program do better. Um, but frankly, I think that there's large concerns about selection bias in these sorts of studies. And just to give a really, to me, what's a pretty clear example, a program called Chess in the Schools finds that kids participating in the chess program outperform kids who aren't. And to me, <laughs> right, I mean, to me, I'm, I'm not totally shocked by that, and I'm not sure that I would attribute it to the effect of the chess program as opposed to the kind of kids who went in in the first place. Um, so when you try to get through that, we did, I would say, find basically one, the Knowledge is Power program, that um, we would, we don't have the, as strong evidence as we would like. It's up on our website. Um, but we would bet that they're making a pretty big difference in kids' academic achievement. And it's worth noting how they do it, which is that they really take the attitude, okay, these kids are behind. They need remedial help. We're not going to give them a normal education, like the scholarships. We're going to give them a special uh, you know, education, special attention. And um, you know, like I said, I mean, we, we are pretty impressed by this organization. Um, we think the data looks good. It's not the same rigor as what I described before, uh, but it is written up on our site. However, the organization that impressed me even more, and if I'd known about these guys when I, was, uh, when I was giving earlier, I would have given to them, is the Nurse Family Partnership. They are not an education program. They're an early child care program. Recall that that gap is there by age five. And what they do is they send trained nurses to visit pregnant mothers during pregnancy and then up through the child's birthday with the goal of promoting nutrition, not smoking during pregnancy, birth spacing, i.e. waiting between births for you know, a long period of time, safe supportive environment for the child. And this did not start as a charity. The first thing they did was not really, you know, was not, was not raise a whole bunch of money, although they had to raise some. It started as a study. It started as three studies performed over many years um, in different regions with different groups of people. And using that randomized methodology that I described before, where they selected which mothers received the visits at random. Um, and they found, you know, I wouldn't call overwhelming effects, but, but effects that definitely appear significant 
in terms of children's cognitive development and in terms of their disciplinary records even 10 and 15 years after this program had ended, which to me is pretty amazing and even more amazing is just the rigor and the consistency of this organization in replicating that program, making sure they're carrying out the same program that they found was working, um, and tracking the heck out of it so they can make sure it's continuing to work as planned. So I gotta say, these guys completely stand out to us in the US um, and you know, was a big thing to learn about them and to learn about the whole sphere of, of what those are. Um, so the even bigger thing that I learned though as a donor comes to the developing world aid, uh, which is the other thing we looked into. Now Ellie and I used to disagree on this. When we started GiveWell as a part-time project just for our own money, Ellie wanted to do clean water in Africa. I wanted to do the achievement gap. Um, and uh, I have to say that over time, I've, I've come around more to Ellie's point of view. And the reason is that um, the opportunities to help people in the developing world are amazing for, for really tragic reasons, I have to say, which is that the problems people are suffering from um, you know, in the U.S., we've got a complicated web of issues that, that no one really knows how to resolve and a lot of expensive programs, um, and I would love to resolve them, but man, in the developing world, you've got children who die of diarrhea because they didn't have like a five-cent packet of nutrients that would have prevented the dehydration or because they're not in the practice of washing their hands to prevent contamination. You've got people going blind or suffering from infant mortality because they don't have a vitamin A supplement. I mean, vitamin A supplements, you take them once a year, they're very cheap. Um, and so just the difference in cost and straightforwardness uh, was unbelievable to me. And just, you know, not to say that developing world aid is easy, it's not, and I will get to that, but certainly the basic opportunities, there's people who are missing cheap, simple things and there's opportunities to really make you know, long lasting differences in their lives. We're talking literally preventing death, preventing lifelong debilitation. So you know, that said, I think it, is, it would be a big mistake to just throw your money after a big name developing world charity. And one of the reasons is that the activities people are carrying out in those countries are all over the map in terms of cost effectiveness and in terms of just how reliable any way I would call them. Um, so this is just one example. Ellie originally, recall, was looking into clean water in Africa. It's a very marketable cause. It's very appealing when you hear about it. As he looked into it more, he was asking more questions like, all right, what exactly is the problem? Is it that they don't have water or they don't have clean water? If they don't have clean water, what is that, you know, what problems does that bring about? And a lot of the time, the answer turns out to be diarrhea is the main concern. Diarrhea is a, a class of diseases. It's fatal, um, you know, for, for young children, generally. And uh, I mean, not, it's, it's often fatal for young children. And um, the issue is that you can, you can improve someone's water supply, but that's not cutting off the only vector for diarrhea. Usually when there's dirty water, you've also got problems with open defecation, with people not washing their hands, with flies um, carrying disease to the food. And so really, when you really look at the different options, uh, in our opinion and in the opinion of, of most experts who have written academically on this, the clean water stuff is a very expensive and not very reliable way to save people from diarrhea. And there are much better options. And so, you know, up here we've got the clean water infrastructure and, and other infrastructures such as latrines being fifteen to forty thousand dollars per life saved. And this is from an academic report um, that we checked out. And then we've also got though way at the lower end We've got hygiene promotion, teaching people to wash their hands, which often is effective even if the water's not, you know, not very clean, which is surprising, but true. Um, and then you've got ORS, which is this packet of nutrients that prevents dehydration, costs five cents, incredibly cheap way, and reliable and historically successful way to save lives. Now, all the way off on the other end of the spectrum, I would put programs like behavior change programs. A lot of people are trying to fight AIDS through sex education. Now, that might be a good idea, um, but you're dealing with another culture and you're trying to change their sexual behavior. And so what we came out of, the more we looked into, is that if you're doing one of these more complex programs, you had better be monitoring the heck out of it and getting a lot of facts about what's actually going on on the ground. Um, and that turned out to be a big challenge. So I gotta say, in international aid, you go to a lot of the big names, and we did. We had CARE apply, we had UNICEF apply, we had World Vision apply, Save the Children. Um, a lot of these guys that you've heard of, and we would ask, all right, what do you do, and what's the evidence that it works? And they would say, which program would you like to discuss? And we would say, well, all of them, 
you know, we want to give an unrestricted donation. We would rather you choose how to find it. We want some sense of your strategy. And just the very common thing we saw is that a lot of these organizations are more like coalitions of programs all over the place and can't give you or won't give you a bird's eye view of what's going on, what they do, what they track, and what they know. Furthermore, at the individual program level, the kind of tracking I'm discussing is very rare. Um, so that said, we did find two organizations that I would gladly, gladly stand behind that I would recommend donating to. Population Services International is a social marketing charity. Um, they sell things like bed nets and condoms that can be life-saving, and they sell them not to make money. They sell them for you know, extremely, extremely low subsidized prices. They sell them in order to better get them into the hands of the people who are actually going to use them. Um, and when we looked at them, we've got the analysis on our website, and there's a lot of uncertainty in it, but we've got them in the ballpark of around a human life saved for every $1,000, uh, which just when you compare it to the U.S. charities, even the best one, Nurse Family Partnership, is $10,000 per child served, um, with the effects from there being a little bit difficult to discern, although we think they're real. Um, so Population Services International, very impressive charity, uh, very well monitored, well documented, very clear. And then um, the other one that we granted is actually very different, Partners in Health. Not, we didn't grant them so much on cost effectiveness or anything like that, but because they have a very consistent strategy of building community health programs that are addressing all of people's needs. And that might sound pretty basic and simple, but it's not common. Um, there's a lot of cases where organizations have AIDS money. They've got to use it for AIDS. And they're ignoring, not because they want to, because it's how the money is, they're ignoring you know, other issues, malaria, tropical diseases, vitamin A deficiency, et cetera. And Partners in Health is very consistent about going from place to place and doing comprehensive health care. So we recommend those two in that area. And I would say we're pretty happy with that. We think they're good. Um, but the bottom line is I think we just have a ton more work to do in developing world aid. After our first year, my main takeaway is this is a big bang for your buck area. It's better than I thought. It's probably what I would bet on as the best bang for your buck. Um, and also, there is so much more to learn about. There's so many unanswered questions we have about a lot of the other interventions that we've heard of, but haven't been able to find someone implementing in, a, in sort of a proven way. So I can, I can go into that a bit more. It's also you know, described on our website. Um, but basically what we're doing right now, the research right now, is sort of focused on developing world aid, taking a different research approach than we had before, relying less on charities to get us information and more on them as the last step of the process, and doing more of a top-down approach to identifying great interventions and priority areas first, and then finding the organizations that carry them out. So that's what we're working on now. Um, and then as far as the future goes, one of the big questions for us is donor demand, which is something we're going to get to in one second. And it's, you know, our target market. Remember, we're a startup. We started this with seed capital a year ago. We're just trying to get to know right now our target market. Um, and uh, I think in a lot of cases, the people in this audience may fit into it. And, and that's part of the reason that we'd really like to hear from you and get your thoughts. Um, you know, we want to do things that work for our donors. And the target market's based on us. So we listen to what we care about, we listen to the survey data submitted on our website, we listen to what our donors tell us, and from that we think that what we're working on now is good, um, and what's likely to come up in the future would be global warming issues and disease research, things that a lot of people care about and would like better information on, better public information. If there's other causes you guys care about, we would love to hear about them. Um, so that's pretty much where we are. I mean, do you want to, Ellie, do you want to kind of close or do you want me to? All right, so. Let me just close with where the project is as a whole, and then I'll take questions about the research and about this. Um, as I said, we're a startup. We've been around for one year, and the goal of that first year was to raise seed capital from people who knew us, our former coworkers, um, create a resource that doesn't exist anywhere else, public info on this sort of thing, on where you should give. Um, and what we haven't done yet, and what we're working on now, is increasing the influence of this research and specifically the amount of money it moves. And what we mean by that is the amount of money that people are giving to charities based on our research. If we can show that that's a lot, if it's a lot and we can prove it, then charities will be incented to open up, to share their info, and to compete on results, not just traditional marketing. And if we can't, it doesn't matter how good our research is um, if people aren't using it. 
And so to do this, we're kind of aggressively pursuing what we call a give well pledge. And what the way a give well pledge works is let's say you're a donor, you would say, I pledge X dollars. And then we come back in about six months with our list of recommended organizations, which again, right now is developing world aid, could be other stuff later. Then you, we would write up the pros and cons of those organizations as we did in our first year. And you, the donor, would pick one and write the check there, not to us. And so the idea is that people who make a GiveWell pledge, they're not supporting GiveWell. They're not paying any of our operating or anything like that. They're also not giving up the most difficult part of the choice, which is kind of these, you know, these guys are curing blindness, these guys are improving incomes, which way are you going to go? Um, all they are doing is they're saying in advance and formally, I will use your research. I will let you narrow the field for me. Um, and we are pursuing that in order to have a number we can point to, that we can prove, and we can say this is the amount of money riding on our recommendations. So those are the two things we're working on now, is researching, developing world aid, and trying to increase the amount of money that's uh, going by our research. And just to close, I mean, I would say this is key because the biggest objection we've gotten to our project from people in the sector is not anything to do with our research or the quality of our evaluations. You know, generally get good feedback on those, although we'd like yours. We get, the biggest objection we get is the idea that donors don't want it. Donors don't care. And we've gotten like the sentence, donors don't care about effectiveness or donors don't care if they actually help people. We've heard that too many times to count. That exact sentence, I didn't exaggerate. Um, and the issue is that there's, there may be some truth to it. I think a lot of the fundraisers we talk to say donors give because of social pressure, because you, know, you induce guilt with a, with a picture of a child and they want to relieve that guilt. They're not giving because they want to actually help people. They don't care about the facts. And this is what we get. Um, and we don't identify with this. We don't agree because of where we were as donors. Uh, but to really, to really find out that we're right and that that's wrong, we're going to have to find more donors who feel the way we do. Um, and so that's the real key to making this go. And again, to a world where charities are not just competing with the pictures, but competing with the facts. Um, so that's where we basically are now. And we've handed out folders with our contact info. Um, and anyone here who either wants to use our research or knows someone who might, uh, we hope that you'll get in touch with us. And you know, there's also a supporter form on our website. Um, so that's basically where we are. We also wel welcome just general questions and general information about the causes you're interested in, what you want to see us do. So that's it. We're going to take questions now. I'd be interested in, you know, giving a, a give well pledge or whatever, but there's probably a few charities that I already give to that I care yep. about. Do you intend um, publishing all the charities that you've rated and what you think about them or just the ones that you recommend? Yeah, well, as a general rule, we do publish, we publish everything. So we put all the materials on there and we say how we chose charities. And so we will, you know, you'll get a sense of why the ones that didn't make the cut didn't. Um, we're certainly not hiding it. Um, on the other hand, we tend to focus on the best because it takes a lot of work to understand a single charity. We want to save our time and we want to recommend the best ones we can find. And so the short answer is, you know, there will be information on everyone we've looked at, and there is, um, but, you know, the much longer reports and more info is on the best ones. Right, so if you go there now, you can see everyone we've looked at thus far. Um, like, so all 150 organizations have their materials. We also say anyone we haven't written up more fully, we say why. Right. Um, and generally, what we found is that you're much more likely to find ev no evidence of effectiveness, in which case we say, we're sorry, you know, there's not enough of a case to make to pursue this organization further. And for each area, we explain you know, what that, that bar for evidence was. Who else is doing anything like this? Are there any opportunities for collaboration? Um, the thought that crossed my mind was community foundations, which exist right. to give donors information. Uh, is there any opportunity to share the information further than you already are? Yeah, or I get would more say information? so. I would say there's opportunities. Um, basically, where we stand, the, the, there's a lot of other people doing, you know, at least conceptually the kind of research we're doing in terms of I got a lot of money, where do I give it? Um, we don't know specifically what they're doing because of all the secrecy. And that's what Ellie mentioned. This, isn't, this is a sector that's got a lot of secrecy in it. And so we've talked to a lot of foundations. They're not comfortable being public about whom they support and why. Um, but it's something we work on. And so we're trying to create the pressure. We're trying to call them. And you know, we've even made some preliminary headway with that. 
I should clarify. Who, who is doing similar work? Who is willing to share the information with you? <laughs> no one we know of, and that's why we're here. Um, basically what I'd say. So just a comment and then a suggestion. Um, even if a lot of your donors aren't interested in the effectiveness of their money, it doesn't take a whole lot of them to be interested because that's still the, you know, three quarters of the whole pie, right? So right. You know, oh, even, right. if, even if only a third of your donors are oh, interested. Right. I mean, if it were 1%, it would be the size right. of the Gates Foundation. So. Right. So right. one suggestion might be, you know, if, if I'm thinking of donating, I am going to get a company match. Um, it would be nice Great. if the company actually said, hey, there's an organization that has no overhead that you can use to figure out charities if you want. And if you can get, what, 20% of the people from Google to use your organization, you know, that's a pretty big Agreed. cut. I mean, that's a pretty big amount of money you're, you're you know, having influence over. It seems like just talking to some big companies and saying, can we offer our service for free? Who do we talk to at Google? Yeah, that's <laughs> what, this is exactly what we've okay. been... <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know. It's a good question. I can try to find out, but yeah, but that's exactly it. what we want. I mean, exactly what we want to do is find. You know, we're offering what you know right now essentially a free service to donors. We're just trying to tell them we're doing this research. We'd appreciate if they would tell us in advance that they'll use our research as a way of proving the demand, um, and we just want it to let them know it's out there so they can use it if it if it suits them. Right. Well, I think saying you know you're offering a free service and it really is free, then companies would. Yeah, you know, hopefully have some traction. Well, yeah, we're. I mean, we're we're working on it. That's uh, and and yeah, it's a great suggestion. Obviously, I don't think that I really uh, explicitly answered your question earlier about long-term versus short-term results. I mean, I, I sort of got at it, but um, you know, what we've done is is we focused right now more on sort of proven, scalable, and cost-effective ways to help people directly, um, partly because. We want to focus on something that we have more confidence we'll be able to study well, um, partly because we think that stuff, from what we've seen, might be underinvested in for various reasons. Um, but, you know, it's a matter of what our donors want. And in the future, I think that we, we've got our eyes on some of the more long-term stuff. I mean, you yeah, saw and, global warming and on just there. Just one, one thing to, to point out if you're interested is we, we audio record our, um, our board meetings. And so, you know, well, this one actually broke, right? So we don't have the audio. But at, <laughs> at our, Sadly enough, but at that, when we decided between PSI and PIH for our grant in our global health category, we had this exact debate in our board meeting where part of the board was very interested in the direct short-term effects, let's say, of Population Services Internationals. Others said, you know, PIH building the hospital will have a longer-term right. effect. And so we had that debate, and, you know, it, we ended up voting in favor of, of PSI. Three to but, two. Three to two. But that's the type of questions yeah. that we're asking and the exact types of debates that we don't, we see being had sort of in general, but not in, 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 in the context regard to specific, specific right. organizations and specific activities. Uh, so one thing that um, I find myself more interested in charity-wise is microfinancing oh, yeah. uh, organizations. So I'm wondering how you guys, if you guys have a plan to kind of uh, research that yeah. area, I guess. Well, that's right on the, I mean, that's, that's right what we're doing. Um, we actually, we looked at microfinance in year one, um, and we have written about it on our website. It's something that I didn't go into much because the main thing we found is that there's, it's, it's a lot of it doesn't work the way that you often hear, um, and there's a lot of information that's very important that's not so easy to find. Um, it's on, I mean, what we're doing now is developing world direct aid, and we're first doing health, then doing economic empowerment. The second category includes microfinance, and we're going to be, I mean, we've learned a lot. We think we're going to have a much better shot at, at cracking at this time and finding someone really good. At this point, we don't recommend anyone in microfinance. But we have a long report on our website. Yeah, you know, going explaining through why. what we found and yeah. why, we, why we didn't find someone we're confident in. Yeah. Another interesting question, which I don't think uh, you or anyone else can really answer, are along the lines of theories of change. Is the world yep. going to be a better place in 50 years if I give to public health versus if I give to education? Um, I think a lot of people have different opinions. There's not a lot of proof. But it might be interesting for some donors to make a decision uh, after reading discussions on this. Yep. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, providing such discussions? Do you know of any resources that do? that might give people a perspective that might help them make up their minds? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's something, that, um, it's something that definitely, it sounds interesting. We want to do it. 
we've got a we've got a small focus on it in our current project, just in the context of international aid, in terms of the debates over you know what's the way to help a country escape poverty for the long term. Um, it's not something we focused on yet, but we're we're planning to at the very least read what's been written about it right in academia, summarize what we've read um, in the context of charity. And I agree with you; it's a great question. We could do more on it than we are. I have a question for you about the governments that receive the aid, because I think yeah. this is probably one of the most inefficient way of spending money is to give a financial aid to certain governments which just pill force squander it. Yep. Have you tapped uh, with your research into that field, and have you been working with any uh, foreign government agencies about uh, the way how they spend the money or what they plan to do with the money or how they structure the yeah. international aid? Um, that's, a, that's another one of the debates we've been having a lot lately. Actually, you, you guys are right on the, the conversations we've been having. Um, you know, basically what I can tell you right now is that a lot of the research we read recommends um, going through the governments for sustainability reasons. And to be honest, we don't find the arguments that compelling. And so one of the things we've been doing is kind of calling some of these authors and, and trying to get conversations with them and say, can you help us understand this a little bit better? Um, I think a lot of the trade-off is between kind of the idea of, of long-term sustainability is in these people's minds more likely to come through the government. Um, and yet at the same time, I think your point is right on. There's major concerns about corruption um, and there's big questions. So um, this is something that we will be writing more about in the future. And I should mention that for those who are, who are interested in questions like that and the real details of what we're doing, we've got a blog. Um, it tends to be pretty dry these days because it's just kind of us saying what we're researching. Um, but if you're really interested in these issues, it's you know, it's a good blog. And um, we've even, for those that, who want to be overloaded, we have a public email list, or it's a by invitation email list, but we're pretty open with it and, and hoping to make it public. And there we have, like, you know, emails going out all the time. We've, we've been having this debate over it, so. So maybe you just answer this question a little bit, but beyond, like, pledging money and telling our friends, are there other things we can do to help with the research? I don't know if you're, like, backlogged on charities to look at or? Yeah. Um, and we have, we have a small, I would say, I mean, the primary way to help is, is the pledging and the friends, but we have a small group of volunteers um, that we have working on research projects like the one that Holden talked about before. You know, the question of if you want to help a country escape poverty, does health drive economic improvement or does economic improvement drive health? And so if that's something you're interested, we, you, know, you can talk to us after, or we also have a form on our website where you can check you know, volunteering, and then we'll, we'll get in touch with you. Yeah, it's givewell.net slash get involved, and it has, it has all the ways that you can help. And uh, you know, yeah, we, we do work with volunteers, especially good and ones. And I, I mean, I'd say the, uh, the most, one of the easiest ways to get involved is to read what we've written so far and tell, you, tell us what you think about it. Yeah. That's true. All right, well, if anyone else has questions that they'd rather just ask us from a closer distance, um, please do come up, and uh, we hope to hear from some of you soon, and thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you learned something good.